Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope you joy enjoyed Goodbye Dragon Inn. As you may know, we're here tonight at Acme to launch this wonderful book uh, about the film that you've just seen. And so I'm very, very pleased to be able to introduce its creator, Nick Pinkerton, who is kindly joining us from New York. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know Nick, it's no stretch to say that he's one of the most important and thrillingly idiosyncratic film critics to emerge this side of the millennium. Uh, his writing has appeared in places like Film Comment, Sight and Sound, Art Forum, Freeze, Reverse Shot, The Guardian, Four Columns, Harper's, The Village Voice. And he also operates the Substack newsletter, Employee Picks. If you don't already subscribe to his Substack, then I would heartily recommend that you do so. Uh, for a monthly dose of some of the most insightful and delightful film criticism currently on offer. So, hello, Nick, and thank you so much for joining us in Melbourne. Hi there, Annabelle. I am I'm flying high after <laughs> that introduction. I don't know if I can possibly live up to the hype that uh, you've just you've just well, given me. You already have by writing this beautiful book. Um, which we're going to oh, recommend to anyone, if they haven't got it already, to run over to the Acme bookshop and get it. Um, we know you're all probably a bit tired and hungry, so we're going to keep this chat short, about 15 minutes, but it's a real treat to have Nick here, so I do recommend that you stick around. Um, so, Nick, let's jump into it. Um, By all means. <laughs> in the introduction to your book, you say that one of the reasons that you wanted to write about Goodbye Dragon Inn was because, you know, despite appearances, it's actually an incredibly rich film. There are so many ideas about film culture, Taiwanese history, love, loss, that are all elegantly buried in there, um, and several of which you unpick beautifully in the book. But I thought we could start by giving everyone a little bit more background, um, in particular to the Wuxia film that we see playing inside the cinema in size film because not everyone here will probably be familiar with Dragon Inn. So do you want to talk a little bit about that and maybe its importance to Sai? Yeah, uh, Dragon Gate Inn, uh, the King Who film, which is the film within a film in uh, Sai's picture, is the second major Wuxia production uh, by filmmaker King Who, who had been previous to its creation, Hong Kong based, had been toiling uh, for years in various capacities at the Shaw Brothers studio in Hong Kong, and had <clears throat> finally had a breakthrough work as a director. He'd worked in the past as an actor and in various other uh, capacities. But finally had a big breakthrough work for the Shaw Brothers uh, called Come Drink With Me uh, the year previous to Dragon Gate Inn. Come Drink With Me is in 66. And immediately after having sort of begged and pleaded and done everything in his power to be able to make films in the directorial capacity, <clears throat> pardon me, um, having finally accomplished this and having finally had a palpable hit with Come Drink With Me, he immediately signs with a company in Taiwan so he can get out from under the thumb of Run Run Shaw and uh, away from the uh, sort of industrial concerns at uh, Shaw Brothers Studio. And so lights out for Taiwan and makes this second also extremely well-received uh, wuxia film, which is Dragon Gate Inn. And so it is, of course, a very important film in the history of the wuxia, the like martial heroics uh genre, but also an enormously important film for the Taiwanese industry, because here you have somebody decamping from Hong Kong and from Shaw Brothers and setting up shop in Taiwan at a period which is already probably the most prolific period of sustained filmmaking in the history of the Taiwanese industry. So it's among other things, a kind of 
uh, major major event in Taiwanese film history, the fact that you have King Hu decamping from Hong Kong, setting up shop in Taiwan and making this very marvelous film. And then Sai said that he first saw the film when he was 11. The film was a huge hit. So everyone across Southeast Asia is turning up in truckloads to watch it, which connects to this idea of a, a really thriving movie going culture, which we see in the start of the film. Um, in the second half, or after the prologue really, uh, the rest of the film kind of connects more to Sai's other work about the changing face of our modern cities, feelings of displacement, alienation, and here this is all kind of focused in on the Fuho Grand. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that and how that connects to Sai's filmmaking, how, how it came to be involved? Um. <clears throat> Let me think on this one for a second. I mean, the the actual location, the Fuho Grand, is a place that was come across through pure serendipity. Uh, it's not a single screen, in fact, a two screen. Uh, though you don't see the second smaller house uh, in the film at all. But it's a mixed use uh, complex built, I think, in 1970, which combines one large hall, a second smaller, about 200 seat uh, hall, uh, but all in a, as I say, mixed use complex, which has residences, shops, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and was come across by pure happenstance, I, it is in the general vicinity of the neighborhood that I was living in in the late 1990s, uh, was extremely impressed by its thousand seat main hall, uh, utilizes it for one extended scene in What Time Is It There, which has a lot of the basic DNA of Goodbye Dragon Inn in it, because among other things, uh, as I observed, the theater had by the late 90s kind of turned into a cruising locale. Um, and this plays into both its usage and what time is it there and uh, Goodbye Dragon Inn. And he was offered a chance to buy in on the theater, which was very much on its last legs, uh, opted not to do so. Um, but from the sort of seedling of that initial usage and what time is it there, grew the project that is Goodbye Dragon Inn in which the theater very much is uh, a central element, let's say. And it's interesting because the Fuho is not like a, a really famous Taipei cinema. It's more just kind of emblematic of, of the idea of like a neighborhood cinema that, you know, people would turn up to, especially, you know, at the height of this kind of movie going culture. And then in the book, you really nicely connect this to what's going on in cinemas across the world, especially in America. Um, and now obviously that we're seeing that even heightened with the pandemic. But this sense well, of I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> sorry. Um, do, do you want to no, no, finish no. your, your <laughs> thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the Fuho Grand is representative of a sort of theater that started to disappear really by the time I was born, which is to say the single screen uh, urban, I won't say palace because it's hardly that, nor is it really technically a single screener. Nevertheless, uh, the non-multiplexed uh, one large screen cinema of the type that the Fuho Grand represents, it's a type that you know, used to be very much the standard, the neighborhood cinema, um, the, the downtown palace, which, you know, by the time that I was born, these had already been 
going under the wrecking ball, uh, been vivisected and multiplexed and cut into all sorts of odd shapes. Um, and this is a phenomenon, as I say, that you know, took place the world over. Uh, took, I think, slightly longer to occur in, for example, uh, Taipei, but did indeed. And it's sort of unusual that the Fuaho still exist. And that it does, I think, is owed entirely to the fact that it's part of this mixed-use facility. So you can't just pull it down without pulling down a bunch of people's apartments and market stalls. Um, and still, insofar as I'm able to figure out, is there just going to rack and ruin. Um, well, you sent me that website with the you kind of the urban guerrilla explorers. Yeah. All the rotting movie posters and <laughs> decay, evocative decay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so obviously it can appeal to beautiful metaphors of cinema culture now. <laughs> um, but... Uh, there's obviously, the film is, is both an elegy and it can feel like a goodbye, um, but there's a lot of hope and optimism and, and affection in the film, um, which complicates, as you said, it's a very rich film. Um, so maybe just to kind of end, if, if, if we were watching a Nick Pinkerton remake of Goodbye Dragon Inn, if we were going back to, you know, the formative experiences for you, age 11, perhaps, you know, in, in your version of a movie palace, or I guess when you're 11, everything feels like a palace, right? Um, what, what, would, what would be the film that's playing and where would we be? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I do get into this a little bit in that I open by talking about seeing uh, the extremely horrible film Spawn at... Uh, the uh, Tri-County Multiplex, that uh, the nearest theater to neighborhood that I grew up in. Um, and the fact that even this as wholly unbeautiful an experience as it may be can be representative of some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, lost uh, horizon and can in some way be uh, inducing of nostalgia but if I were really to like go back to a warming formative experience I was just thinking about this the other day uh seeing a naked gun two and a half theatrically and there's a moment in the film in which uh Leslie Nielsen George Kennedy and OJ Simpson slide past an open elevator in sort of perfect uh, perfect harmony. It's this very well-timed little gag. And I recall seeing the movie in the theater and at this moment looking at Leslie Nielsen, George Kennedy and OJ Simpson and thinking, I love these three men so much. These are the most wonderful men that I've ever seen. I'm so privileged to be having this experience that there was a first naked gun with such a treat but that they have come back to have further adventures with the police squad is such an extraordinary thing. I'm in awe of the privilege that I have been handed. So yes, that would probably be, and I, I guess I would be like nine or 10 years old yeah, at this let's, point. That let's would probably be. Like that, that's the, the thread that guides you through this beautiful, inspires this beautiful career and all the incredible- 100%, 100%. Awesome. <laughs> Um, we should probably wrap things up there, but thank you all for coming along tonight. Thank you, Acme, for hosting this wonderful event and for supporting the Decadent Editions as our publishing partner. And a huge thank you to Nick Pinkerton for joining us. If you haven't already bought, bought his book, please run across to the bookshop and do so. Good night. Thank so. you, Annabelle. <laughs>